summer has arrived. Apparently, we just skipped right over spring and we're in the summer. Um, grass is growing like crazy out there, so thank you to all of those who mow and <laughs> produce more pollen in the air for all of us allergy sufferers to breathe. Praise the Lord, we are overcomers, even in allergy season. Um, this morning, um, the Lord kept saying awe and wonder. And I think sometimes that, I was thinking about that, I'm like, when is the last time like I've been awed by God? When was the last time I just sat in wonder? You know, and, and as I looked up some scriptures, his works are all a wonder. Yeah. I mean, how many times have we, I don't know about you guys, but I sat on, sat in the ground and just looked up at the stars. When you're out in the country, you're out of park, or it's, you're outside of town a little bit where you can actually see the stars. And you just wonder. He created all of them. And he just spoke it. And it just was. Our God is awesome. He is awesome. And it takes just a little spark of curiosity. Just, uh, just the, the smallest need, the, the smallest hunger or thirst, right? We call that curiosity, hunger and thirsting. Yes. And as soon as we start to, to look to him, to call on him, oh, he reveals himself. Yes. And we have an opportunity to just look at him and gaze in wonder and let ourselves be struck by how wonderful and awesome he is. This life is so mundane sometimes, and this flesh is so controlling. Oh, it fights every day to control our minds, to control our thoughts, to control our actions. But if we steal those stolen moments with the Lord, it takes just a second to just pull back, pull, to disengage, and just to, to call on him. Whether it's a word, whether it's a thought, whether it's just a quiet moment to say, I love you, Lord. And his presence, his yes. peace comes every time, doesn't it? Yes. Every time when we yes. just stop. And his work is a wonder, right? But he has rested from his work. So now it's our turn to work wonders. Yes. To show the wonders of God to those around us who don't know him like we do. But we can't stop being struck by his wonder. We can't stop nurturing that love relationship right you have to have those stolen moments of intimacy to keep a relationship alive and healthy it's no different with the lord he wants that same intimacy and out of that comes much good fruit and that is the strength that we have the confidence that we have the light that shines into the people that don't know him and don't understand how good he is but the work that is left is the work of the holy spirit in us he sent his comforter. He yes. called him the comforter and sent it to be in us, for us, to transform us to be like him. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. Uh, and I'll go back one verse, chapter, or verse 9. But it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Do you love him? then you can't even fathom the things that he has laid up for you just right. to walk right. in. Right. Just to walk in and just to step up, open your eyes, and today there are miracles, wonders, visions, intimacies to be just discovered that will just fall upon your lap if we just open our eyes and look, if we hunger after them. <coughs> but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. How often have we prayed, God, reveal your mysteries. Reveal these hidden things that are saved for this time, for this age. He is waiting for us yes. to be curious enough yes. to search it out so he can reveal yes. it. He wants to reveal it. He's not withholding anything. It's his desire to reveal the deep things. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. He has freely given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So I encourage you, hunger and thirst, look expect to be in wonder and awe he desires to reveal those hidden things in our lives he, he desires for us to know so that we can reveal them to those around us that yes. need so desperately to know him yes. 
So be encouraged and be in awe of our wonderful, wonderful God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, anyone? Yeah. talking I was thinking about Joseph right talk about an example of why do good things happen to, or bad things happen to good people it was so that God could put him right where he wanted him and give him the most ultimate favor so he could save a nation yes. he saved a nation but he had to go through the pits he had to go through the the jail he had to go through false accusations he had to endure all those things but he never once stopped believing God was for him and God was for him in the middle of that pit where he should have died in the middle of that jail and when he when he he didn't even have to he didn't have to defend himself even but God God was for him and so things are not as they appear we have to remember that over and over God says things are not as they appear you believe that he is for you and we will just stand in, in awe, right? We'll just stand in awe and go, wow. Wow, God, you worked every detail out. Yeah, Deb. Every time. Amen. He's faithful every time. Every you know, time. Joseph was a type of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so you had the suffering inside mm -hmm. of him. But ultimately, he was glorified or mm -hmm. exalted. And we're, we're the body of Christ. Yes. So Jesus told us in this world you'll have tribulation. Mm -hmm. But be of good cheer. Yes. I've overcome the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
just a roller over, and God was with Joseph. Yes. He was with him when he was going through the yep. house. Yep. That's right. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's true with us, too. There's a plan and a purpose. And Pharaoh and the enemy, the devil, he does everything he can to disrupt that or discourage us in the process. That's what the Bible plan is all about. The only thing we have to do is resist the devil. Yes. The way to do that is by declaring what yes. God has said about it. Yes. And that causes him to flee because he has no argument. No. And the answer is what the Bible says. That's right. And, and we have to remember that it's not that God is just with us. God is in us. Yeah. In us, He has given us the Comforter that abides in our heart that cannot be taken away. It's not just with us; He is in us. Yeah, yeah, amen. Yes, James. Yes. You're better, James. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So we just 
just ask you to pray that she'll make better decisions. Uh, we believe God has a hand on her life. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a two-way with God. I mean, we, God does work in our life, but we got to do one thing, too. we got to be willing, have a willing heart, open our hearts up, you know, and then God will come in. You know, it's not about works. It's about opening yourself up, you know, because it's, it's, it's evident. That's always the difference between seeing Satan and Jesus because, you know, Satan wanted to talk to himself. You know, my will, my will, my will, you know, I want to rise above. But Jesus, he surrendered. My yeah. Father's will. Let your will be that's done. Right. And that's the big difference in our life. We let God's will be done. That The yes. Lord's Prayer is so beautiful. Yeah. Let your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Right. That, you know, God, whatever your mind is, you know, that's what we want to happen in our life. Amen. And it's so, it's so much better with our life when we surrender. Yeah. We don't fight against God. We surrender. <laughs> I teach school, and, and I teach and drive the big trucks, and the students always do better. When they listen to an instructor, mm -hmm. they always, when they fight the instructor, mm -hmm. it's a hard six <laughs> weeks, let me tell you. But when they listen, because you have experience, and when God created you, he knows what's best. That's right. And and when, when God was talking about Jesus here on earth, he said, hear him. This is my yeah. beloved son. Right. Hear him. Yeah. Hear him. Yeah. Hear what he has to say. Yes. He is speaking for me. Yes. Okay? Yes. He's speaking my heart. Yes. And, and I just want to just thank the Lord.
So that in itself was a prayer being answered to be at ICU. I thank you for that. But I pray, Lord, um, I need your kingdom to come forth. I pray for uh, your anointing to walk with me and help me with the words. Uh, these people know who I am, but that Lord, we can't really talk about it, stuff like that because I'm walking into a place that's not, not work related. So there's no none of that authority there. So I walked in, and there was a lady there. And she said, uh, she said that uh, she was uh, a friend of his and stuff like that. And I, okay, and I was just trying to, in the Lord's way, change the atmosphere of what's going on in the room. And I finally got sat down and uh, looked at Tony. He looked at me. He recognized who I was, uh, things like that. And I sat down next to him and stuff. And says, you know, there's about 15, 20 people praying for you with me on this situation and stuff like that. And his eyes kind of like, okay, this is cool. So, um, make a long story short, uh, this lady's husband showed up who just happened to be a co, uh, uh, well, actually he's a customer, but a friend of Tony's, they ride uh, Harleys and stuff together. <clears throat> so Mike showed up um, and strangely enough, this is how the Lord set the path. Uh, him and I have never talked about the Lord, but randomly, not randomly, God ordained for him six weeks ago to send me an email and it had a scripture of Psalms on it, all right? And we've never had this conversation. I just love the atmosphere, the kingdom atmosphere, go. So he sent me something in Psalms. So I understood where he was at. And, you, and most of the time when we're talking, he walks into the front counter or he calls me on the phone. This isn't the conversation. But that fragment of the Lord speaking through his life happened at that time in that email six weeks ago, and I let it go, okay, Lord, you got something going on there. So he walks in, his wife is already there. Um, I keep remembering when Jesus wanted to heal, he sent everybody out of the room. Well, everybody that was in that room was supposed to be there. There was nobody else but him, uh, Tony, and, his, and uh, Mike's wife. So we were talking and stuff like that, and I was talking about uh, uh, revivals, uh, things like that in the past, just to, just to see where they're at. And I brought up the International House of Prayer, and they, unknown to me, understood that situation. So immediately I knew the atmosphere was there. So God, you got this is the way you want it set up. I turned around and just spoke it out, said, Tony, do you want me to pray for you? And he shook his head, yeah, because he wasn't able to speak yet. He just put in a, a straight down to me and, uh, get his words out. I asked him earlier, have you been up and walking yet? He said, no. No, he didn't say no, but the lady said no. His right side is still uh, numb because of the fluid that's been in, on his brain. He can barely get his hand, right hand up over his face. So in the midst of the situation, he's trying to work both hands and stuff like that and see his feet moving around a little bit and stuff, but nothing was manifesting out. So I knew I had to trust the Lord and pray for him. I actually had a bottle of oil that I've had for years that I take on special occasions. I've had it for like 15 years. <coughs> But I know, and I explained to him, I said, this is not any power of me. This is the Lord Jesus. He's in this room. Uh, this oil in itself has no power, but it just represents the power of the Holy Spirit and stuff. So I laid my hand on his uh, right arm and just started praying from the top of his head down to the soles of his feet. And let it happen. Let it happen. Lord, let the kingdom come in the room. And I, can, I, I sensed the presence in my spirit. He was filling the room up. And I had to leave it. Let it soak, let it soak, let it germinate. Let the Holy Spirit rain on it like rain and some dew. So I spent a little more time on it, and then I left and went home. The next day, the yeah. sales, service sales manager calls me and says, you ain't going to believe this text I just got. And I'm going to, how's Pastor say, I'm going to paraphrase this. Um, <clears throat> he said, they got Tony up for therapy and stood him up, and he walked 20 yards. Oh, God. Okay, he walked 20 yards and he sat down once in the midst of it. And he is feeding himself with his right hand. Praise so the God Lord. is manifesting. Yeah, yes. stuff like that. Yeah. And so Mike Carter, the guy was there, his wife, Tony, and I, who were in that room when the presence of the Lord saturated Hallelujah. that room, knew the beginning of this total restoration. So Tony, Praise, Praise the Lord. For your yeah. glory, Lord. Yeah.
answers right out of the equation, yeah. Yeah. which is the best way to yes. do it yeah. <laughs> every time. All right, any other needs, any anything else? Yes, yeah. before we go on. God only wanted me to share this again this morning. And God gave this to me some time back, and it was specifically uh, for Jody. But um, I go back to this a lot because I needed it. He gave this to me for, for her specifically, but it was that morning. And I believe it's for me every day. It's for us every day. If you're waiting for you to feel good enough all the time, you will be waiting until the Lord comes back or you die. Look in the mirror and see who you, who you really are. Does God see the reflection? daughter or son that truly has his DNA. Even with your darkest thoughts, you still don't have a choice but to shine. His light is your light. He sees only that light. And as we worship this morning, focus on the reflection God sees in your mirror. Him. Yes. Well, with that, let's stand and let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the wonder-working power that you've placed within us, Lord. Through your shed blood, Lord, you made the way, Lord, to send your Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to abide in our hearts and minds, Lord, for every need, for every situation, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, that we look to you in awe and wonder this morning for all that you are, Lord. For your wondrous works, Lord, that you continue to do as you work them out in our lives, Lord. That you care for every detail of our lives, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have you have unveiled the mysteries of the deeper things, Lord. As we hunger and we thirst, Lord, we look to you, Lord. That you would be glorified, Lord, as we live, we live our lives hidden in you, Lord. No longer us who live. Lord, we lift yes, up those Lord, needs this morning, yes, those who need your touch, Lord, those who need a deeper understanding of who you are, Lord. We lift up Bibi this morning, Lord. Yes, Lord. We lift up uh, those for healing this morning, Lord. We lift up the, the yes, cancer, the masses, Lord, the hearts, Lord, the, the blood vessels that need you to touch, Lord, that these bodies, Lord, every body, Lord, every need, Lord, spoken, Lord, when we are called upon. It is you that they hunger and they thirst for, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you reveal yourself to those who are yet to call upon you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that your light shines to give hope, Lord, to those that are lost in darkness, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you never gave up on us, Lord, and we will not cease to hope and to pray for those. Those around us, Lord, that don't know the words, Lord, that don't know the way to you, Lord, let your light draw them, Lord, let your grace and your tender mercy draw all those to you, Lord, for you are good, Lord, you are for us and you are in us, we thank you, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your wondrous work, and we give you all the glory, Lord, as the testimonies come that we fully expect that you continue to do your work, Lord, in this earth, Lord, through your body, your people. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Friday, June 13th, will be Eastern Gate House Prayer this month. 7 p.m., I would assume. Oh, and uh, Father of Lights. Jane. That is a wonderful DVD of, of understanding God is Father and God is love. All right, let's speak the word this morning. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick and they do recover. The Lord. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. 
I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Jesus. John and uh, Donnie, you want to come take the offering swing? Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. In all things, we will praise you, Lord. We will glorify and magnify your holy name, for you alone are worthy. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to your name, Lord Jesus. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy, worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. Lord. Glorify your name. Every knee will bow. Every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Every knee will bow. Every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord forever.
harm. Nobody to rescue me, nobody would dare. I was going down for the last time, by his mercy I've been spared. Not by works, but by faith, through him who is called. For so long I've been hindered, for so long I've been sold. I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. Yes, I'm saved by the blood. So glad. Yeah, I'm so glad. Yes, I'm so glad. I want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. to you, Lord. I give it all to you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, for what you've done and what you're doing right now in this room, Lord. You're healing power. You're healing power. Those prayers that were brought up this earlier, Lord, you have answered them, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Because into your hands I commit again all I am, Lord, for you, Lord. You hold the world in the palm of your hand, and I am yours forever. Jesus, I with you I walk with you
worship. I will worship. I will worship. Worship Him, even in your trial. I will worship. He knows you're coming in and you're going out. Lift your voice and to the King of Kings. I will some of the nastiest things and not be moved at all. I mean, not outwardly. I mean, horrible situation, circumstances. But when the presence of God touches me, it is so sweet and so real that I'm overwhelmed and humbled and I don't mind crying like a teenage girl <laughs> in his presence. beautiful God Amen. and it's moments like these that we experience that beauty Amen. that love, that grace that it doesn't matter what your gender it doesn't matter your age but he's so sweet he's so real and so beautiful you can't help but be touched and moved and we respond in all sorts of ways some people it's a shout some people it's the weeping unique to all of us. That's what yes. makes this relationship special and, yes. and, and genuinely uh, personal. <coughs> Praise the Lord. And I wouldn't change any of that. Amen. Amen. Pentecostals have been ridiculed for their <coughs> exuberance and overactive, you know, kind of responses. But I'm telling you, God 
is moved by the feelings of our infirmity. He, he has feelings. He can be touched. Jesus wept. I'm sure he laughed and, and he rejoiced. And our God knows how to touch us where it moves us the most, where it's the most real to us. And I'm so grateful to him for that, that he's, he's not just some far off distant power or, or source of uh, life, but he's a very real person, intimately concerned and cares about each one of us, no matter what it is we're going through. You know, I'm sure all of us came here today with other issues besides just coming to worship the Lord. But you know, for a few moments, they're gone. Yes. They'll come back, the thoughts will come back, the, the anxiety, all that stuff will happen. But for a few moments, we've been refreshed. We've been renewed. We've been in his presence. Jesus. Amen. And I, I just, I hope that we can all take that with us and be reminded that that's, that's the way he wants us to experience our life, with hope with joy, with peace, with expectation of good. Amen. That's what I'm experiencing here this morning. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. God bless you all. Thank you so much, uh, worship team, as always. Tremendous as you uh, submit and, and uh, yield to the presence of God. We all get blessed. Thanks, everybody, for your testimonies. You set the stage for worship and uh, make it possible for God to really be exalted, magnified. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right. Praise God. I want to... Uh, I want to give you some more hope, praise the Lord. I almost used your notes, but praise the Lord. I want to uh, talk to you about some things, uh, three things that I think really, uh, this is going to be a little bit different kind of uh, message maybe, but it's, it's about grace, it's about the goodness of God. But I want us to have hope. Uh, you know, there are, there are things in life that the enemy uses. People use them too, and obviously that's who the devil uses. Uh, when it talks about Paul having a messenger of Satan uh, that tormented him was like a thorn in his flesh, it was people. I mean, if you read about his life, it was he was being stoned, he was being shipwrecked, he was, you know, people were doing stuff to him as well, and uh, mainly the uh, Jewish uh, religious leaders, but uh, in all walks and, and areas that he traveled, uh, he was harassed, he was persecuted, he was messed with, and it was the enemy that was behind it, but it was people that he had to face, and it's true in our lives, you know, it doesn't make the people necessarily demon-possessed. It just means the devil uses people, just like God does. And if we give in to our baser kind of senses and feelings, we'll play ball with the devil all the time. It's only through our flesh that the devil can operate. And it's only through our spirit that God can operate. So we're yielding one to the other all the time, and uh, even to ourselves. So I want to talk to you this morning about... Uh, us in particular, I don't get it too personal, but I'm just saying that, you know, I look at the church and I think, okay, God, what are you going to do with this? And sometimes I just throw my hands up and say, I don't know if you're going to do anything with it. But the more I look at the way God operates, there's always a big picture with God, but there's always a, a personal picture as well. So when we read the scripture, we can see the general kind of uh, attitude that God has and the way that he's working through his people, Israel, or through the church in, in the case of the New Testament, um, but also how he works through individuals. So I want, to make it, I want to make it as personal for you as I can without, you know, offending anybody in the sense of making you feel like I'm picking on you or that I'm calling you out. I'm just saying we're all screwed up. Hallelujah. 
all, all the rest of us are too. But it's all right. I'm not saying we should revel in our screwed upness, <clears throat> but we shouldn't be surprised that we are. And we shouldn't be discouraged in thinking that God won't do what God can do simply because we're not doing what we should do all the time or what we would like to do even. So this is about the church in general, but it's about us in particular. And there's, there's three things that I want to talk about. When I say the church, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about all of us, the whole thing, the body of Christ. When I talk about leaders, I'm talking about me. I'm talking about pastors in general, other leaders of the church throughout the years. And also about culture, how the enemy uses these things. People have their agendas within these things, but God has a purpose in all of it as well. And that's what I want us to kind of get the focus on. Otherwise, we can be very discouraged and depressed, uh, go shoot ourselves or each other, and just, you know, take the cyanide pill and forget about it. Or we can believe that God, even in all the mess, has a plan that's still being carried out. So we can look at the church and say, why isn't everybody here? Why isn't it more than it is? And blah, 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 blah. And have all the questions that we probably all ask ourselves, wonder where so-and-so is, where's this person, why aren't they here? Well, we wanted the same thing about it when you're not here. But I'm just saying, I'm not mad at anybody. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm, I understand all this. We all have lives. We all have family. We all have other situations that sometimes take us vacations, whatever. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But I'm saying that if we focus too much on the who's not here, we miss the who is here. Right. You know what I mean? If we worry too much about why this isn't happening, we're, we're not seeing what is happening. Right. And uh, it's true in the big picture. It's true individually in our personal lives. It's true in the body of believers. So with that said, let's, uh, I want to read two scriptures to you. One from Isaiah, Isaiah 42, verse 16, and then Ecclesiastes 7 and 10. We'll begin with Isaiah 42, 16. Everybody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, Isaiah 42, verse 16. And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and... I want to emphasize this, and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. So he's going to make all these things happen, but the crooked things he's going to make straight. And, and I want you to notice especially that it's, it's what he does. This is what I will do, he says. Amen? All right. So now let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 10. Say not thou, what is the cause that thou former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Now let's read it one more time. Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. You can leave that up there for a moment. Let me read that to you from the Message Bible. It says, don't always be asking, where are the good old days? Wise folks don't ask questions like that. Praise the Lord. I think all of us probably know people who never really enjoy today, whatever today is, whenever today is. They're never happy with what's happening now. It's because they're so sure everything used to be better. I could go into all kinds of personal things. I'll try not to. Ouch. No, it didn't hit me. Um, but... People who live that way are always looking 
they're, they're like, uh, anybody ever remember the Greyhound races? Anybody ever go to Omaha besides to see the zoo? Well, you got these beautiful, sleek, really fast dogs, and they're all chasing a stuffed rabbit, which they never catch. And I, I always wonder, you'd think they would learn like Pavlov's, you know, shock them, you know, or, or give them food or something, you know, that they respond, they react to, uh, you know, stimulation. Greyhounds have got to be the dumbest dogs on the planet because these dogs race for the better part of their lifetime and they never get it. They never get that that rabbit's not going to get caught. But a lot of people live their life that way, chasing a phantom that never really is ever going to exist. And they always, it's, it's like, you know, if I could just go back to this particular time, those were the good old days. Man, it was great then. But they never enjoy the todays because they're always wishing it was what it was, what it might have been, what they thought. And those people are, are generally what I would call idealists. They're always looking for a perfect world. Yeah. And they're like the greyhounds, chasing something that they're never going to catch. They're always looking for this flawless experience, this flawless relationship, this perfect environment, you know, the perfect job, the perfect marriage. The per Look, we're people. It doesn't exist. I'm not saying we shouldn't strive to be good people, good employees, good husbands, good wives. I'm just saying we, it, it's, it's, a, it's a dream world. It's why people get divorced. It's why they, you know, go back and reconnect with people and all these things, thinking that, you know, that somehow it'll be better. Praise the Lord. So, the good news is there's something worse than idealism. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And it's called cynicism. The cynicism is idealism on steroids. <laughs> it has an eagle's eye for what is wrong. But it has a bat's blindness for what's good. Luke chapter 11, uh, let's read verses 47 through 51. Luke chapter 11, 47 through 51. This is a reality check this morning, praise the Lord. We all need them every once in a while. Woe unto you, for ye build the sepulchres of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Truly ye bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and ye build their sepulchers. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they say, shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. So, you know, the scripture is talking about religious people who had a long history of killing the prophets, but then later building monuments to their name, the same ones they killed. <laughs> Hallelujah, praise the Lord. So, legalists, uh, Pharisees, the so called spiritually elite are not any different today. They don't kill anybody anymore, but they're masters at finding fault with the church, with the pastors, leaders, and with the current culture. They seem to forget everything's been screwed up since Genesis 3. It's like it's a revelation to them that somebody is messed up or that, that churches aren't perfect or that culture is screwed up. Everything's screwed up. Everything's been screwed up since the fall, since Genesis 3. That's what the Bible tells us. Now, I know today's church is far from perfect, this one and the entire body. 
But the church has always been messed up. Thinking, well, okay, where's the hope in this, Nathan? <laughs> but let's look at this. Revelation, we'll just look at two places. I, we could go all through it, but let's just look at Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. This is the, you know, we know that this is a, like a, uh, a side view or sectioned out thing of the entire church throughout time. But it's also a reality of a present day church that existed in the first century when, when John had this revelation. And, uh, and it's about Ephesus. And he says, nevertheless, this is Jesus talking, and he said, I've got something against you because you've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I'm going to come to thee quickly, and I'll remove your candlestick out of this place, except you repent. Now, this is Jesus talking to a first century church, which we all think, man, I would have loved to have been in that first century church, all the power and the glory, and blah, blah, blah. Well, it had its issues. Now, look, look at, uh, uh, at chapter 3, verses uh, 15 through 17. Now, we're talking about the church of Laodicea, another church that existed in that first century. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would, thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. You make me want to vomit. I used to work with a guy when I first came back from Texas, and we were starting a church. Uh, I worked at a pharmaceutical uh, warehouse filling orders for uh, you know, doctors and, and pharmacies and stuff all across the United States. Well, mostly here in, in the Midwest, but it, it, some of it went all across the United States. And I worked with this uh, young black guy. And he, he and I just, hit, for some reason, hit it off right off the bat. And uh, he, he had a kind of a sarcasm that I just loved. <laughs> it kind of matched my own cynicism, if you will. And, and he used to say that, he'd say, Nathan, you make me want to vomit. Because I just irritate, you know, we'd joke around and stuff. And he said, you just make me want to vomit. And I got the biggest kick out of that. I just thought it was the funniest thing. I know, obviously, you had to be there, but I just, I'd come home and tell Sally, you know, I'd repeat the things he was saying, and she'd look at me like, what in the world is the matter with you? Like, this guy's great. But that's what Jesus is saying. You make me want to vomit. You're disgusting. You're ignorant. You make me want to puke. Because you say you're rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing, and knowest thou not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So the church has been messed up from its inception. It's been screwed up. Let me, let's give you some history. When I first was licensed in the church, there was a whole series of things you had to do. And for each graduated uh, step in the process, from local license to general license to ordination, there were tests. There were written tests. There was a, a list of reading that you had to do. Then there was a written test. Then there was an oral test for all of these different stages. So I read a lot of history, church history and stuff that I thought was an absolute waste of time, except that I figured it's like most of you do when you go to school, uh, so I can pass the test. Yeah. You know, you really don't care about the information. You just got to get it so you can take the test. But in I've learned over the years, I've got a lot of these books still, and, uh, and about different people, about churches, about denominations, and so on and so forth, but about individuals as well. And it does come in handy every once in a while when I get to thinking too bad of myself or the church. Because 500 years ago, the scripture was so buried under tradition and rituals that the people that were in the pews had no idea what was being preached. They had no understanding of the Bible whatsoever. The precepts, the concept, they had no, no real idea. The church was so obsessed at that time with money that they offered forgiveness and a free pass to heaven for large donations. Now, we think that sounds crazy, but that's exactly the way it was. You could do anything if you had enough money, and you'd get a, bless you, and a straight line to heaven. No purgatory, no hell, just heaven. Now, those were definitely not the good old days. And just a hundred years ago, there, a liberalism just swept through Christianity. 
pastors, theologians, the seminaries themselves, they denied the supernatural, they rejected the fundamentals of faith, and they questioned the reliability of the Bible itself. Now again, that doesn't hardly sound like the good old days to me. And just 50 years ago, everybody was declaring the culture and, it, and Christianity's irrelevance for one another. Those of you that are old enough remember Time Magazine cover that said, Is God Dead? The seminary said, uh, you, we need dialogue, not preaching. And they, they predicted that nobody was going to be willing to put up with a sermon that was longer than 15 to 20 minutes. Well, I've proved that wrong. <laughs> not that the sermons are that good, but your endurance is unbelievable. I was always told that <laughs> they could only absorb as much as their bottom could withstand. So, you know, once it starts getting numb, it's, you, everything else is tuned out. I, I discovered that to be about an hour and ten minutes. I push the limit sometimes, so when I see you limping out of here, I know why. But they were wrong because the local church had a future despite all of its flaws, despite its failures, despite even its bogus theology. Let's look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Familiar scripture, but just look at it in the context of what we're talking about. Peter's got this revelation. And I say unto thee, and this is Jesus speaking to Peter after the revelation that he was God in the flesh, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The rock is the revelation of God in Christ, or God manifesting himself as our Savior. And so he says, I, that I, Peter, upon this foundation, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Praise the Lord. So with all the things that I've just read to you, and they're just a little microcosm, really, of everything that's been going on for the last 2,000 years, but I just picked those out because they were pertinent and something that we might remember and have relationship to. But God has always had something up his sleeve. 500 years ago, it was the Reformation. Looked like all was lost. Nobody was getting anything from the Bible. And those that had control of the Bible were ripping everybody off for big bucks just so that they could convince those idiots that they were going to go to heaven simply because they could pay their way out of their behavior. And then along comes the Reformation. Praise the Lord. A hundred years ago, when all this liberalism swept through, what happened? God begins to pour out His Spirit. Pentecostalism, evangelicalism came along. God had something up his sleeve even when it looked like everything was going to hell in a handcart. The church itself seemed to be unraveling, and all of a sudden, God moves and shakes the whole thing up. Freaks everybody out the same way he did in the Reformation. And 50 years ago came another unsuspecting God up his sleeve move. The Jesus movement, all these wacko weirdos, hippies, dopers, unaccepted in local churches. They start having church in coffee houses, in parks, in homes, at wherever. That's right. So I'm pretty sure God's got a plan for today. 2,000 years of church history and the promise of the founder of that church gives me hope. No matter what I see on Christian TV, no matter what I see on CNN or MSNBC or Fox News, or I still have hope. No matter what I see right here, I still have hope. No matter what I see in the mirror, I still have hope. Because today's leaders, today's pastors, they're still flawed. They're also far from perfect. 
Isaiah 42, 16 says, I'm going to make crooked things straight. It's nothing new. God always has drawn straight lines with crooked sticks. Abraham was a liar. Moses was a murderer. David was an adulterer. Peter was a denier. But strange things happen with the passage of time. And that's where Ecclesiastes 7.10 comes in. Don't be saying whatever happened to the good old days all the time. That's not wise. The further removed we get from the stick, the more likely we are to give credit to the stick instead of the God who's doing the line drawing. The closer we are to the crooked stick, the harder it is to see the straight line that's being drawn. So until these people die, but then all of a sudden everything changes. With the passing of time, they begin to magnify the good and forget about the bad. I'm always saying if I live long enough, I'm a candidate for sainthood because there won't be anybody around to tell you how bad I was. You know, history, that's why history gets changed because the people that can defend the history, I mean, you hear all the time arguments of, of, that the Holocaust never existed. Well, you can't. That's just so crazy at this point because there's too many people around that, that experienced it. But over a long enough period of time, I get away with it. See, the pattern goes all the way back to the church fathers. If some of them were alive today, and this is not an indictment against them, I'm saying this is, the, this is humanity, this is life. But I'm telling you, some of them that we have looked up the most to. If they were alive today, they wouldn't be allowed to teach a junior high Sunday school class. But in their day, God allowed them to lead his church. Messed up theology, screwed up lives, and yet God used that crooked stick to draw a straight line. He does it with churches. He does it with individuals. He does it with pastors. He does it in every area. That's God. That's called grace. John Calvin was a profound theologian. I've got several books by him. There's hardly anybody that doesn't quote John Calvin. He was a prolific writer. He wrote all kinds of papers, books. A tremendous theologian in his day. But let me tell you something else about John Calvin. He also allowed his followers to torture and kill one of his opponents, burning him at the stake for denying the Trinity. Now, that's hard to defend. It's hard to justify. Or it's hard to explain away. Yet Calvin is one of those quoted and admired theologians of our day. Martin Luther's anti-Semite writings and speeches are an embarrassment to Christianity. But most Protestants don't hesitate to trace their roots back to the 95 Thesis that he nailed to the Wittenberg door. Now, again, without Luther's courage and commitment to the authority of the Scripture alone, the church would still be selling indulgences. But it didn't make him perfect. He hated Jews. Now, how about John Wesley or A.W. Tozer? If I've got one book, I've got 20 books by A.W. Tozer. Great preacher, pastored in, in Canada and in Illinois, tremendous theologian, theological mind, brilliant. Or it, Bob Pierce, who was the founder of uh, World Vision. 
all of them had horrendous marriages. Horrendous. I don't mean just a bad dysfunctional marriage. I mean horrendous marriages. And I, I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but I, I, I could. I'm just not going to. I'm just saying they were awful. They were awful husbands. They were terrible fathers. And yet, they remain the heroes of the faith. The good that they accomplished is widely known and remembered, while their failures have long been forgotten. They were powerful men. They were used by God, all of these guys, and many, many others that I'm not mentioning. They accomplished great things, but they were also deeply flawed. They were sinners, saved by grace. Amen. And God used them. And before you start measuring yourselves among them, I don't care what your issues, what your dysfunctions, God wants to draw a straight line with you. Now, if he can do it with people like this and do the kind of things that he did, don't you doubt for one moment what God can do with your life, what God can do through you. As, as messed up as you might be at times, as screwed up as you think your situations are, God is still capable of doing the most profound, powerful, supernatural works through screwed up people and in screwed up churches. He's got a purpose. He's got a plan. He's got something up his sleeve for each one of you and for this church. It's, it's true today. That's what I'm saying. Broken men and women, sinners, dysfunctional. They make mistakes, sometimes huge mistakes, sometimes multiple mistakes, sometimes the same mistake multiple times. And yet God continues to use them in his grace. Yes. He's still drawing straight lines with crooked sticks. The odds are he'll continue to until Jesus comes again. See, that's what the world doesn't understand. Because we try to project this image of perfection, and only a blind fool would not see through that. When in fact we are flawed, we are messed up, we are crooked sticks, but we have confidence in a God who can draw a straight line with me as messed up as I am. I, I, I've said before, I, I've done some crooked things in my life, and if it hadn't been for Jesus, I wouldn't have needed a coffin. They could have just screwed me into the ground. I was never a drug dealer. I, I dealt in drugs, only for my personal use. <laughs> but I ripped off friends. I remember at a buddy's house one time over on the east side of Des Moines, East Grand, right down near the Capitol. And he was so screwed up that he passed out, and he gave me, this is how screwed up he was, he gave me this dope to watch for a few days so he wouldn't get ripped off. Being the good friend that I was, I took it and went about 15 or 20 blocks west and got high for four days and got a couple of other people high too because after all, I'm a good guy. But then I came to and realized, well, Lou's going to be looking for that dope. Oh, man, talk about creative thought. Went to Grand, Haven, or Grand Rapids, Michigan one time with an ex, a buddy of mine that was in the Marine Corps with me. We were in Vietnam together. We went to a drug dealer, got some heroin, told him we were taking it to uh, Kalamazoo. 
We took it to Aspen, Colorado. Never sold any of it. We were supposed to be selling it for this guy. He was fronting it, as they say. He just fronted us a trip to Aspen for two years. <laughs> yeah. I got high in every truck stop bathroom between Grand Rapids, Michigan and Aspen, Colorado. I was a great guy. Those are the good things. I'm just saying, God can make straight lines yes. with crooked sticks. So we talked about the church, we talked about pastors and leaders. How about culture? There's no question that the culture that we live in right now is headed in a godless direction. It's alarming. I mean, it's, it's frightening if you pay too much attention to it. I try not to anymore. I don't hardly watch any news. You say, well, you just, you're like an ostrich. I don't care. I'm sick of being aggravated about things I can't do anything about. I'm sick of being mad at people who are just pawns and too ignorant to even know it. So let's look at Romans 12 and verse 2. So we think, of course, our culture is far worse than any. I mean, historically, we're going to a place we've never been, and this is awful, but this is what Paul said to the Romans 2,000 years ago. But don't be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to this culture. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. They had the same issue. Their culture was corrupt. Their culture was screwed up. And and just, uh, you know, as a side note, to go back to the church itself, Paul wrote letters to all of these churches about... I mean, churches with Christians in it. And he had to write and tell them about their morality because they were still going to the temple where they had uh, prostitutes. I mean, it's hard for me to fathom, but religious prostitutes. And I used to think being a Catholic would have been great because you could drink. I don't know what the name of that religion was. But I bet they had revival <laughs> all the time. I mean, I'm talking about from the flesh. And Paul had to write a letter to a church of believers, of Christians, telling them to stop doing it. You would think that, like, well, they would get that, wouldn't they, once they got saved? Well, wow, praise the Lord. I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself or not, but we think of these great, great men, and, uh, you know, I'd say even Paul talked about Moses, talked about Abraham, David, you know, Peter. But what about, I mean, even Paul. You think, oh, man, because there, there's been many times in my life I felt really bad that the church, the first church we started, it still exists. But uh, it, never, it never got above, I don't know, 45, 50 people or something, if that, before I resigned the organization. And that was after... Five years, I think. Somewhere in there. But I find some consolation. <laughs> you know, we always look for somebody that's a bigger failure so that you feel like a success. But, but we think of Paul, we think, oh, this guy, this, this giant apostle. But listen, he, the churches he founded were all screwed up. That's why he had to write so many letters to them. Stop screwing your mother-in-law. Stop going to temple prostitutes. 
Stop getting drunk at church. Man, I, I never had that issue. I mean, I had some issues with people in churches. I never had those. Had most of the others, but I never had those. So, you know, what a great leader. They say the people take on the personality of, of the pastor. Well, that's not saying a lot for Paul, is it? And the guy had a, here he is, the guy that preaches the whole message of grace. And he can't even get along with the other people. He couldn't forgive John Mark for gutting out on a mission trip. He freaked out. The kid was scared. And, and it comes to, he wouldn't forgive him. He wouldn't ever take him back. And eventually Paul and Barnabas sp split up over it. And there's no record of them ever communicating or, or working together again as a result of that. That's the Apostle Paul. I'm not saying this to demean them. I'm just saying the record's there, and the reason the record is there so that we can see that God uses screwed up people, screwed up institutions, screwed up cultures in order for him to move directly through that yes. and be revealed. Yes. So it's nothing new that Paul was writing to the Roman church. Paul had to tell them, don't do that. You see, people fall into two traps, and those traps are, one, they project the future as if culture moves in a straight line. Or they view the past through inaccurate and romanticized eyes. All of us do. We look back at our past, oh, man, that was the greatest time, and blah, 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 blah. And we look to the future, and we see, okay, this is the direction it's going. It'll just continue straight down the road. We're trapped by those two kind of ways of thinking. Now, I'm speaking in general terms, but I want to give you some examples. The baby boomers, of which I am one, post-World War II. They were projected to remain anti-authoritarian, pot-smoking anarchists. Praise the Lord. Nobody would have pegged them for SUVs and minivans and Tommy Bahama shirts. They figured we'd be 65-year-old bearded wackos laying under an herb tree somewhere, <laughs> contemplating our navel, wondering about the reason of life. but they moved right into corporate America, right into the middle class, right into the lower middle class, right into the upper middle class, and just took over where their parents left off. Eventually. But if you'd have taken the cultural view that most of us have that projects that they'll continue in that same line when they're 40 that they were in when they were 20, you miss what's really happening in the world. The Gen Xers. They were pegged as slackers who would never get a real job. But things changed dramatically when the dot-com options were dangled before them. The millennials, they were supposed to usher in a civic-minded, do-goodness kind of attitude and behavior. And instead, you know, I mean, that is when they weren't being the pale uh, Want to be rappers yeah. <laughs> or hyped up on ecstasy? Or, or how about this? Consider this the so called greatest generation. This will blow your mind, especially if you've watched any TV for the last two weeks. I saw so much war, I wanted to kill myself. <laughs> I was so guilty for having survived. Or the other option was my neighbor. He was out of town, and I didn't have the courage to kill myself, so I survived the whole world at war for two weeks. I know more about Hitler than I know about my own dad. Praise the Lord. 
But did you know that they were assailed by the press and they were criticized by their parents and their elders of that day as the lost generation? I'm talking about the men and women who fought and died and gave and sacrificed so much for World War II. The lost generation. A generation without a thought for social responsibility is what they were called. Back then, no one seemed to guess that this lost generation would one day be called the greatest generation. See, the culture didn't continue moving in a straight line. A war came along and changed everything. Now, all of this gives me great hope that just maybe the imperfect church, its pastor, and our culture today may one day be looked back with fondness as the good old days when God drew straight lines with crooked sticks. So before you sell out and give up and throw in the towel and say, I don't think he can do it. I don't know why he would want to do it. God's got something up his sleeve for your life, for your relationships, for this church, for this culture. He's not through yet. It's finished, but it ain't over until he says it's over. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we're just grateful that you're not intimidated by our weaknesses, our failures. You take the foolish things of this world and confound the wise, the weak things of this world to overcome those who think they are mighty. It's, it's all about you, Lord. It's always been about you. It will always be about you. We're just a stick. But man, what you can do with a stick. Amen. We thank you, Lord for all of the blessings, all of the grace, all the mercy, all the forgiveness, and all that the future holds for us that is great and glorious in you. We thank you for those who have gone before us, not because of their greatness, but because of their humanity, because of their flawedness that helps us to realize we can have confidence in you, even in our failures, even in our weaknesses. Nothing is impossible with you. For that... We give you thanks. And everybody said amen. amen. Praise God. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great Sunday and a better week. <laughs>